All right. So, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming to today's episode of The Outlet, Lunch and Learn with She Tech's Extraordinary Women. Today's episode is the seventh episode in our ongoing She Tech webinar series. We can't believe that we have already hosted so many episodes, and we are so glad to have this amazing opportunity to share the thoughts, learnings, and strategies from different leaders with all of you. Thank you so much to any of you that have been a part of any of our previous episodes of The Outlet, and thanks for being here today if it's your first one. I'm Meg Virig. I'm the program coordinator and community manager over at SheTech, and I'll be your host today. We'll be recording today's webinar, and we'll post a link to the recording on the SheTech Power community as soon as it's available. You can also follow us on our YouTube channel, SheTech Global, where all our videos are posted, including past episodes of The Outlet and the recent SheTech Virtual Conference. Right now, all of our attendees are muted by default, and we'll also have time for Q&A with today's guests after our interview is over. Please submit all your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box as they come to mind. We'll let you know that it's been received, and then we'll be sure to get those questions answered by the end of today's session. Today's episode of The Outlet is brought to you by SheTech Inc., a nonprofit organization registered in New Jersey that's dedicated to increasing the number of women in the tech staffing pipeline. Today's episode is called Negotiate with Confidence, Getting What You Want Out of Your Career and Your Life. We're talking to two extraordinary women today, our own Chaya Pamula, SheTech founder and PamTen president and CEO, and Maria Ramirez, who is a renowned economist. She's CEO and president of MFR Inc. She's a SheTech power team member, and she's also Chaya's own mentor, or one of Chaya's own mentors. Chaya Pamula is SheTech's co-founder and also the co-founder, CEO, and president of PamTen, one of our sponsors here on the outlet. PAM10 is an award-winning global IT services and staffing organization, conceptualizing innovative software products and solutions for its clients and overseeing them from development to implementation. Through her work leading PAM10, Chaya saw for herself the challenges of hiring women in the tech field. Though there were jobs available, Chaya didn't see many applications from women in tech. Chaya went on to found SheTech to increase that number of women in that tech staffing pipeline. Chaya also combined her business acumen and passion for charity to found Softkin, find us at softkin.org, which is a nonprofit organization that operates in the U.S. and in India and creates loving and caring homes for over 100 children in need. Now, our guest today, Maria, has, also, or has enjoyed an almost five-decade career in the financial industry, mostly as an economist, making her perfectly suited to tell us about negotiations today. She is president and chief executive officer of Maria Fiorini Ramirez, Inc., MFR, an independent global economic and financial consulting firm, firm formed in August 1992. Before starting her own firm, Maria's career included positions in many financial organizations, including Drexel Burnham Lambert, where she became the first woman managing director and chief money market economist. Maria is also the owner of MFR Securities, Inc., the broker-dealer subsidiary of MFR. MFR Securities is a certified woman-owned minority broker-dealer. It participates in underwritings of equity and debt securities and executes fixed income product transactions for many of its inst for its many institutional clients. In the not-for-profit sector, Maria has been director or trustee for 25 entities currently including the board of Brooklyn Hospital, Morris Museum, and for several years was on the boards of the Brooklyn Community Foundation, Notre Dame High School, Lupus Research Foundation, and More Project Brazil. Maria graduated from Pace University and was honored as a distinguished alumna of the Pace University Lubin School of Business. We're so glad that you could join us on SheTech's The Outlet today, Maria. I'm going to hand it over to Chaya now so we can get our conversation started. Thank you very much, Meg. Maria, welcome. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on this panel and especially our association being there for many years and you being on the uh, SheTech uh, board and also uh, associated with the Softkin nonprofit organization and obviously being my mentor in business and everything, even in personal life. Uh, tr truly admire your uh, experience and your knowledge and it can take the complete day for us if we have to really talk about everything. So we are going to be focusing on the negotiation skills uh, today so uh, I know you have a lot to talk about it, considering your knowledge and experience and many, many, many decades of your experience, especially in the financial industry. So um, I, I, the, today, especially we want to uh, focus on specifically for women who struggle 
uh, in, in with the negotiations in their career, personal life. Um, so as we all know, negotiation has always been a very important skill, even more so in the current challenging time of pandemic for everyone and any gender for that matter. Uh, there is no single day that, um, we, that goes by without negotiating about our choices, with friends, family, also at work, about salary, position, or about an agreement. So we will focus, uh, we will focus on three different segments today. Uh, first, on negotiations in your career, and then we'll speak about personal life, uh, negotiations in personal life, and then move on to the strategies for negotiation. So coming to the first uh, segment, negotiations in your career, Unfortunately, studies show that women make 82% of what men earn in the pay gap, um, and the pay gap increases for women of color. A general observation is women oftentimes face extra trouble in the process of negotiation. They are penalized for deviating away from gender stereotypes of nurture and inclusiveness, whereas men are permitted more leeway in, or in order to express their qualities of leadership, and are rewarded better as they assert themselves. The most difficult thing in any negotiation is making sure that you strip it out the emotion and deal with the facts. So Maria, when you were getting started in your career, what led you to want to become a better negotiator? Did you have an experience that led you to want to improve these negotiation skills? Well, thank you, Chaya. And it's really a pleasure to be part of SheTech. You know, I'm really enamored with everything you've been doing. And I think that for us uh, ladies that have been around a little longer, you know, it wasn't easy for us to do this, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, I've been working more than 50 years. Uh, so I think that historically, women have been um, underselling themselves, underselling themselves in the sense of not having um, enough um, chutzpah, as they say, or guts um, to demand more. But I think that there is a style to it. I think, first of all, you have to be very confident in yourself. Um, you have to know your skills. You have to know what you contribute. Uh, you have to know how to go about it in a way that's successful. And I always use the example of you know, the carrot instead of the stick. When you work for an organization, you have to kind of, you know, be part of the layers that you have. You know, you have different layers of supervision and bosses. And I think that one way that I did it, which was kind of, um, you know, worked out, was number one, I didn't realize I was on the page until somebody else made me a job offer. Uh, and, you know, through that job offer, my salary doubled. This was a long time ago. And then three months later, the company I worked for went out of business. So I got another job offer. And that was, again, doubling my salary. So I didn't know what I was um, worth in terms of income and salary compensation until I stepped out and looked for another job. And the reason why I stepped out was because um, you know I was the first woman doing certain things uh, in terms of a job and what I accomplished, and management didn't know how to compensate me because there was a track for men to go at certain levels at a certain pace, but there wasn't a track for women. But now we have so much history of what women have accomplished. I mean, there are more women graduating from college and getting a master's than men for many, many years. Um, there is much more diversity in the workforce. Uh, more businesses are started by women, especially uh, diversity women. So I think that we have so much that we've accomplished in the last 50 years. So sometimes we should take a back seat and appreciate what has been accomplished and also figure out how to make the best of it going forward. So I learned from mistakes. 
and not certainly mistakes that I made in terms of um, judgment uh, in, you know, how to ask for a raise was because I just didn't have a mentor. I didn't want, I didn't have anyone to go to, to ask for advice. But when I did ask for advice, it was from men. And men were the one that promoted me. Uh, they put me up like on a pedestal where I was successful in uh, meeting clients, uh, getting in the media a lot. Um, so I think that mentors that anyone that believes in you, and at that time, um, unfortunately, there weren't that many women that I could go to or any, uh, but there were men that had daughters or that understood what I did and benefited from what I was suggesting or saying or doing. And they were generous in rewarding me and helping me to start my own business 30 years ago. And there were you know, institutions and people all over the world and 95% of them probably were, were men. Uh, some of them, I remember being in Germany once, and the guy told me that a woman would never do this, like start her own business in economics. And I said, well, that's why I'm not in Germany. But you, you have to kind of understand the culture that you are in and you are working in. And I call it not rock, rocking the boat too much. You know, you could get what you want. You have to express it. Um, but also you have to make, you know, a person that you report to feel good about giving you what you're asking for. So it's a process. But in different cultures, you could get different things done. And I think that one has to be sensitive to the differences. And in the U.S., it's the freest part of the world for women to succeed in. I mean, I come from a different background. Chaya, you come from a different background. And I always say, thank God I'm in the U.S. because in all the country in the world, I could have done what I have done. So I think that we, we have to be grateful for being here and the opportunities that exist here, whether it's mentorship, whether it's capital, you know, all opportunities that, you know, we, we couldn't do this in any other part of the world. Chaya, you're on mute. Yes, Chaya, it looks like you're mute. Oh, now you're open. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I can hear um, you. Yeah, yeah. So I was trying to avoid the background noise. Sorry about that. So thanks, Maria, for all that. I agree with you because of, with my background, I also realized that there are many opportunities here in this country, right? You're presented with the amount of opportunities where your responsibility lies in really grabbing those opportunities and finding ways to navigate this system. I think uh, especially for people who are immigrants, it's a great experience to learn to navigate the system because many things that people take for granted, we realize they are some things, you know, which are very precious for us and we do our best to navigate the system. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I completely can resonate to what you're saying. Um, also, Maria, I know there is no doubt that you have had many successful negotiations, especially with your financial background and the work that you do. Um, but I also am told that the best negotiations occur when all parties walk away happy, right? So can you share a scenario where you got the result you wanted and also a negotiation that you weren't happy with uh, the outcome? What happened and how did you feel about that? Oh, there were many times that I didn't get what I wanted. Um, you know, sometimes you work for a person that um, is more of a hindering block to your success. So you just have to kind of um, put up with it for a while. Because if that person is not pleasant to you or rewarding you properly, 
they're probably doing the same to other people. Uh, so I always, when I was in that situation like many years ago, a few times, I always say to myself, sooner or later, reality is going to catch up with this person and they're going to be moved out. They call it the Peter Principle. You move a person that's not successful to another position where they become even more unsuccessful. <laughs> but um, so you, you kind of have to, you know, at least I did. I had the patience and, you know, I, I remember going home at night and I was crying and I was exhausted and I was really upset. Uh, but eventually, you know, I, I, I got another job at the same company. And, and it's amazing when um, I wanted that job, um, the person that uh, offered me the job, he, he discouraged me. He said, this, this job is going to pay less and it's going to be like a lower pay grade. You know, in many institutions, that they have pay grades. And I said, okay, I'll take it anyway, because I saw the opportunities of learning. And I think that, you know, when you're young and you start your career, the opportunity to learn is much more valuable than the, the salary or the compensation that you have. And I think that for the younger generation, the world is moving so fast. Technology is changing everything that we, we breathe and live in. So I think that taking risk is much more important. So sometimes... You take risk and it's failure, but we learn from our failures. If we don't fail, we don't succeed because sooner or later, we're going to make mistakes. And we rather make those mistakes when we are younger than we are older. This way we could correct our mistakes, learn from our mistakes and succeed the next time around. So I am a, a strong proponent of failure in order to succeed. Take a step back in order to go step forwards. But I think also we have to communicate really well. You know, we have to express our desires to succeed. Where do we want to be in three years from now, five years from now? And I think also in expecting, you know, a promotion, compensation, communicate that with your superior or your peop the people around you. And I always say that if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. And of course, we're dealing with this pandemic. You know, a lot of, of us are working from home. It makes it very challenging. But when you have the opportunity to go back to work or to be with other people, you need to do that. Even if you do it on a small time basis, one day a week, one day a month, whatever it is, you need to be visible. You need to be a proponent of yourself. I always call it, you need to brand yourself because you are what you accomplish and you don't accomplish it all by yourself. It's the people around you that recognize how good you are that will help you succeed within and outside the organization. I never wrote a resume since I got out of high school because there was always someone that knew me that offered me a job or brought me on the board of a company. So you kind of have to be really good at what you do, be the best that you can be, but also let people know and offer yourself, what can I do to help you? to whoever it is, whether it's your boss, what can I do to make my boss's job easier? Offer yourself your time, um, your, your willingness to help so that you will get something back. But when you get it back, you get it in multiples because you are not demanding it. You are offering and in the process you're learning. And I think with good communication, whether it's go for a coffee with your boss, offer them, you know, I'll take you out for dinner, or I want to invite you to lunch. Just communicate. With the process of communication, it is clear, understood, what you can get or what you cannot get. So I think that 
be comfortable with communicating and communicating is really negotiating. I mean, for those that have kids, you're negotiating all day. You're negotiating with your kids. You know, they want something and you have to ask, well, what are you going to do for me? Maybe, you know, if I'm going to do something for you, are you going to bring the laundry to the washing machine <laughs> or are you going to bring the garbage out? So it, we're always negotiating. We're just negotiating at different levels. But um, through the process of negotiating little things, you can negotiate big things. But I think the key is enjoying it. You have to enjoy it. Don't be afraid of it. Sometimes, you know, we, we, it's easier, oh, I don't want to do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. No, that's not the way it's going to get done in your favor. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to brand yourself. You have to know what you're worth outside. But I am a strong proponent of having your own business. So think about, are my skills portable? What can I do with my skills? Would people buy what I am doing and paying me for it? So I think that if you start thinking that way, you will have an awesome life, an awesome rewarding life because eventually you'll be able to do what you want to do. Like your child, you're doing a lot of charity and I, I do a lot of that. And then those things really are your passion. So it sets you up to contribute to society all your life because you're creating jobs, you're creating prosperity, you're creating, you know, well-being and joy and happiness. But it all becomes like intertwined because when you love what you do, it's not a job. And I, you know, I've always loved what I did, you know, once in a while, I, I didn't like things or whatever, but you got to have patience because those little setbacks are very rewarding long-term. Great, great points, Maria, especially when you spoke about the, um, today's generation, younger generation, having to deal with all these challenges. Um, it's definitely progressed from the time we started our career to what it is today. Um, women are all working, they're independent, they're able to um, ask the questions. Um, I think as we started off this conversation, as I said, there is still a gap. So it's not just about the salary negotiation, it's also about the position, it's also about how you are treated at the workplace, right? So as you rightly said, when you know your worth and you enjoy your job, um, there is always a door for negotiation, right? So it, 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 you, you may have tough time at work with your boss um, and you're probably overloaded with your work. Um, so do you have an advice for youngsters who are really working really hard and they don't have time for themselves, especially in the financial or legal industries? It's so hard for them to find time for themselves, even to think about negotiating. So do you have any advice for this younger generation that is struggling today um, with the managing their time and managing their demands in, uh, with their personal life and also at work life and still be, a, be able to a good negotiator for, for making sure their career is progressing? Well, I think, Chaya, negotiation for anything comes first. Because if you don't negotiate for yourself, nobody else is going to do it for you or better than you. So unfortunately, the, the period we're living in doesn't make things easy because we are, we're not having that face-to-face -face human interaction that we need to do it. And negotiations by emails is not a good thing because it's easier for people to be ignoring or, you know, somewhat not responding when, when you're doing it that way. But, you know, we have Zoom calls, like now at least you could have a little bit of, you know, that, that kind of interaction where you see each other. I think that in life, whatever you want to do and whatever you want to accomplish, you find the time for it. You know, I, I remember, you know, I was on the board of 10 things at the same time. I had a business to run, clients running all over the world. And people would ask me, 
how do you find time for it? And I always used to think about it. I said, I have time for anything. But when, whenever there is something that is needed and that has to get done, you find time for it. I, I remember I went to school at night. I went to Pace and I got my four-year degree in three and a half years. And I was taking 16 credits every semester and going in the summer and going on Saturday. And I had two jobs. I had a full-time job and a part-time job. So when um, I have, you know, nieces and nephews, oh my God, I'm taking 12 credits. It's such a load. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I'm so stressed out. And I said, you know, you really are not, you know, at your maximum capacity to do more than what you're doing now. So I think that you find time to do what you want to get done. So does that mean that sometimes, you know, you're up at two or four o'clock in the morning? Yes. Yeah, so what? When you're young, you could do that. Uh, you know, you, when you get older, you cannot do that. But I do think that stress is good for you. Working hard is good for you. And I think that it, 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 it gives you a better understanding of what it takes to be successful. Now, you could do that in your 20s, maybe in your 30s. You can't do it when you have a spouse and you have kids and you have so much going on at the same time. But I think that women could deal more with that kind of stress, especially time stress, than men do. I think it is just a fact of life. You know, we are jugglers. We yeah. are the ones that make everybody happy. We're the ones that keep the peace in the office or, the, or whatever, right? <laughs> or at a board meeting, you know, we have the common sense, you know, we come yeah. out with it. But um, so I think that everyone is, is capable of doing a lot. Now, some, some people physically cannot do the same. And of course, you know, with kids, it's sometimes very difficult. But I think if we give ourselves a little bit more to do, we are able to stretch that bandwidth of what we can absorb and what we could get done. I always call myself, I can't do, you know, a lot, but I know who to call to help me get it done. So, you know, I'm not, you know, very good in technology, but I know that I could call you, I could call Prasad and he helps me. <laughs> or, you know, I, I'm not good in certain things, but, um, you know, if I'm sick, you know, I call the hospital that I'm on the board and I say, you know, who do I call? So I think that building a network of a variety of people, whether it's in the arts, whether it's music, whether it's in finance, whether it's at the banks, whether it's at the hospital, the doctors, the lawyers, we know how to call. So I think that is so important in life to have a wide circle of friends, not only culturally, but in what they do, in what part of the world they live, so that people always used to say, well, call Maria, it's only a phone call away from whatever you need. But you need to be resourceful. And it's something that you built all your life. You know, you don't retire from a company after 30 years and say, well, what do I do now? I want to get on the board. I want to do something. And I always say, well, what have you done the last 30 years for society? What have you done the last 30 years in building friendships and relationships and a family around you of friends and support? And I think that young people need to do that. They yeah. need to, you know, there's so many are so altruistic in what they do, but some are feeling the pain of being stressed out, too much going on. But you have to be out there. You have to meet people. You have to socialize. It's such a joy to have that diversity in your life, in languages, in culture, in religions, it just makes you a much happier person. I know, completely agree, Maria. These are all great points. Um, I, one thing you mentioned about, you know, asking for help. 
especially when people are pressed by time and they do not have the necessary resources and we keep thinking that we have to do it all right so ask for help and build that network that can yeah. help you and you're very good at it and you have a fantastic network uh, around you and there is so much i can learn from that so coming to the next question maria it's more around um, developing those skills um i never had a formal training in negotiation skill developing my negotiation skills i learned through my experience i failed some negotiations maybe some the outcome was in my favor um but it's each negotiation requires a it's it's a unique negotiation you can't compare one negotiation to the other because it depends on the context and people you are uh, you know negotiating with and the outcome both parties are expecting right so did you have a formal training in negotiation how did you develop those skills what interested you to or forced you to develop those skills did you have a mentor or somebody or a formal training that you went through so i i, I call i went to the school of hard knocks i remember being a young girl in italy and going to the market with my mother and whatever the person was asking for my mother would offer half so i always learn like how my mother did it she she never paid like retail she always wanted to pay wholesale prices <laughs> so but also i remember traveling like uh, in asia in in in, uh, in hong kong my friends they always to say don't open your mouth because you don't pay whatever the price is listed you let me help you with the negotiations you just point out what you want and keep your mouth shut so i learned that you know you have to make the other person that you're negotiating with that they're getting the upper end of the bar- or whatever the bargain is but you know it a lot of this is social you know you you have like contracts and in writing but i think that when you meet people you know directly we're all human beings and we all want to feel like you know we 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 we're getting the upper end of the bargain so i think that you have to make the other side feel that they're getting their money's worth so i didn't have any one in particular person to train me but i learned that what people are, are, are offering you it's not the last thing and also when you kind of negotiating a, a new idea a new contract whatever and they say no i always say no is not an option no is a maybe <laughs> that the door doesn't close or say what well, maybe it's not right now uh it's not this year but it it's definitely this lifetime not the next one <laughs> maybe in your mind it's a next lifetime but in my mind it's at some point this lifetime but you know i have many uh, japanese clients uh, over the years and i still do and it's a process you know there there is uh, you know planning there's all kinds of stuff that you know has to be approved and it some sometimes it takes years but um uh, i had a, an event a, a couple of weeks ago i had um pursued this institution for 30 years to do business with us and open the door for minority firms to do business with them a month ago the lady called me and say we've changed our minds now we open it up the door a little bit to add women and minority owned institutions and you are the per- the first person that we called so i was like elated because i stuck it out for 30 years <laughs> so i think that in negotiating you have to have patience yes. but also don't get upset and um no is not an, an is is not acceptable maybe is acceptable and that maybe you reconsider in a year in 6 months but little things go a long way whether it's a holiday card or you know something about the person in their life that's happening keeping in touch with them in a nice positive way it helps them have you in their mind so that when the occasion comes that there is something that they need they will think of you 
as a good person to go to because you didn't just go there to get something out of them. You contributed to their success. So whether they're looking for a job or, you know, after something happens to them or, they, you know, their life changes, definitely, you know, you, you stay in touch with them. It's worth a lot. Great points, Maria, especially about, uh, you know, what's your worth, realizing the worth and then asking for it and having patience. That's yeah. the most important thing, yeah. So I think um, that we have a few more important questions. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, one other thing, you know, most often um, I'm left with the feeling that I compromise too much or I could have done a better job in my negotiations. Or maybe perhaps I try to put myself in the other party's shoes beyond meeting my own interests. So how do conversations about neg negotiations differ and how can we use this to our advantage? If, should we? Or for example, how would you approach negotiating an initial salary in a new job? Or how would you approach a conversation about a raise? So there is a well, difference, I, right? Right. I think that you have to do your homework. Like today with, with technology, you know, what kind of positions go for what kind of salary. But I, uh, I think that, you know, you, you have to be resourceful. You have to figure out what position goes for what in order to ask for whatever it is you're looking for. But, you know, these days, you know, so much is done um, with that being in person that you really need to have your facts in front of you. I mean, there are certain jobs in government, for example, where the job description is very clear and the salary and the compensation is very clear. In the private sector, big organizations, you know, it's very kind of clearly laid out, you know, what, what those positions go for. So I think that, number one, you have to be armed with facts. And, and, and number two, you have to prove yourself. So, you know, if you're at a position before of accomplishments, list those accomplishments that are verifiable. And I think that would help a lot, but you have to have the facts on your side. Yes, homework is, 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 is the right thing to do. For everything. Yeah, yeah, for everything. Yes, yes, thank you. And also, you know, I heard about this, uh, you know, negotiations also, it's, I think trust building is the most influential factor in negotiations. So most times, you know, when we're negotiating, we think about our ideal person um, and think about what they would do, and we try to act accordingly. Uh, right. This could be either an influence from the culture or beliefs that are ingrained in our system. So do you ever find yourself using your negotiation skills in your personal life or relationships? How does that work out? Well, I, I think that, you know, personal relationships, I'm sorry, but my battery was going low, so I had to move. <laughs> no worries. This is reality. Yes. I think that... <clears throat> When, when you are confident in whatever it is, you know, you stand for. I think you stand on solid ground. So I, I think that, first of all, you have to be confident in what facts and what ground you stand on. You can't be, like, expecting more than what you are expected to get, right? So, you know... You, Somebody comes to your house and, you know, they need to do something, right? So what do you do? You get three offers and figure out what the best price is. And you're also trying to figure out who's going to do the best job. So you go on the internet and you look for, you know, who did what to who, uh, whether they have lawsuits, consumers reports. I think that, you know, you, you do this in your personal life, you do in your business life, you do in your family life. It, it's always a, like a little give and take. But whatever you could get, you know, concrete facts in negotiating something that's more business-like, the better off you stand. But I think that, you know, you, you really have to go out of your way and do your homework like everything else in life, uh, in, in order to have, you know, a good leg to stand on. 
That, that's that's great. I think you already touched on uh, the relationships and the network. Um, can, can you share an experience where your pre-existing relationship, a good working relationship, really helped you in negotiation? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think that, you know, early on when um, I, I started the business, I didn't know how to price things. Um, the way I looked at it, okay, was, all right, so this is what I'm going to do for you. How much can you pay without it being a big process to get approved <laughs> at your firm? So, you know, it, it, like you want to get something done, you have to ask the other side, okay, what can you pay me before it becomes like a big deal and a, 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 a big process at your firm? And then after you prove yourself, then you could double the price or t triple the price or whatever. So I'm a strong believer to outperforming expectations. And I think that if you outperform what the other party is expecting, you could write whatever you know invoice you want because I think what you want to do when you have your own business is really make your clients look good. You want to make them successful. You want to make your, um, you know, the people that like you and trust you not be ashamed of having trusted you. Or you do not want to jeopardize their position. So you, I always think about, I'm like a, a traffic cup. I want to prevent my customers and my relationships from getting in trouble. Because if they get in trouble, then I'm in trouble. So I, I think of myself as a fiduciary person in everything I do in life. I want to protect the people that I know and I love and I care for from people that want to take advantage of them or people that want to do something that's harmful to them. Because I am a strong believer that this world has, you know, good people and bad people. Fortunately, we have more good people than bad people, but there are some people that have uh, bad intentions, you know, fraudulent activities. And what we have to do, especially us women, is help each other from, you know, preventing bad people in coming close to us. You now we have to be very protective of our circle of support and support each other. And I think women need to do more to help women, whether it's, you know, in, in, in the labor force, whether it's mentoring, whether it's, you know, the negotiating skills. I, I just think that we could always do more than what we're doing. I mean, Chaya, you do a lot. I try to do my best, but all of us combined, we could do more. But also, we need to appreciate the men that help us, the customers that help us, and make them feel good about what they've done for us. And I think a lot of times we don't do enough to appreciate those that have helped us through our career. So, you know, I, I try to do that I, I, as much as possible because you know, men also have daughters and, and they have granddaughters. A lot of my friends have granddaughters and they send them to us for an internship, for training or talking to their sons or grandsons. And I love doing that because sometimes it's easier for the young ones to talk to someone outside the family than inside the family. <laughs> so I feel many in many ways, I don't have children, but I have many children and grandchildren. <laughs> and that gives me a lot of satisfaction when I see them succeed in their career, in, uh, in their life, in their families. And I think the more we do that, you know, the world is a better place. Agreed, agreed. And Maria, you touched upon a lot of important points, um, also a lot around the techniques and the strategy around negotiations. Um, just in the interest of time, I just want to ask one last question before we get on to Q&A. Um, 
No, and I read that it is important to have a strategy ahead of time when you want to get into negotiation. Either it is for your salary, or if you are getting into an agreement, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, building an agreement between two parties, it's important to have a strategy. And not many times you have the opportunity, but I'm just just talking about uh, in a context where you have some time to prepare. So, what kind of negotiation strategies do you suggest to have at a very high level? I think that first of all. you have to anticipate a negative response because if you go about trying to negotiate with a person that is not positively disposed towards you you have to anticipate also that um that reaction may be a negative one so you know your strategy should be to have more than one egg in your basket and i remember many years ago um when um i first got married i you know went for um you know the annual review in personnel and they gave me a 2% raise because now i was married i was going to have children and they couldn't invest in me my strategy was a backup plan i already had an offer from another place um so and and that that offer was very generous and so i told the the person in in personnel that he could keep the 2% because i didn't need it but i had a backup plan so you better have a backup plan before you go in for um something that may not give the outcome that you want but um and i think that worked because i had a friend that had worked with me before or we started at the same job at the same day at another place and she told me about this position and it worked out so i think that you always need to have a backup plan i think you strategize in terms of where you want to be in a year or 3 years or 5 years what is the dream in your life i mean i want to be an airline stewardess of course you know a fat fee too you know it's not was not easy 50 years ago but i ended up traveling more than airline stewardesses all over the world as part of my job and i remember once going to Puerto Rico i was there for like a whole day and a half or something and the same crew that took me there also went back with me and they were laying on the beach for those two days meanwhile i was working but you know uh i think that certain things in life just happen you you could have um a plan and some people really are very good about that but i never really had a plan things just happen but um i always aspire to be on my own and the reason for that i remember many years ago someone told me be with the clients be visible be supportive of them and help them and that would always help you the rest of your life so i had no idea about you know starting a business it didn't come with a manual it came with a lot of mistakes and you learn from your mistakes but you know you have to be flexible and uh i think the path to your life career sometimes just happens and as much as you prepare yourself with a certain skill set sometimes you just have to take a chance to learn something else i mean i i know people that have a accounting degree a law degree a medical degree you know you 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 career your life takes you sometimes in different directions because when we are young or 18 or or 20 we're thinking of certain things but by the time we 30 or 40 other things happen so i think that flexibility in having that backup plan is having a skill set that's portable whether um you know you you're good in um math or science or technology trying to figure out what skill set you have that you could bring that anywhere in the world and i think having a language skills um cultural 
knowledge. You could have a great knowledge of a language, but you could have zero knowledge of the culture. And uh, people always told me that I didn't speak Japanese, but I understood the culture well. It, and I think that understanding the culture of the people you are dealing with helps tremendously in negotiating because you're speaking at a different level, not just at the language, but at the cultural level. And I think that is much more important in a successful negotiation than anything else. Awesome, great points again, yes. So um, I think uh, we have few minutes for question and answers. Thanks Maria for all those insights. Uh, I know we can speak for the entire day about this, uh, more than a day. Um, so I'll pass it on to Meg to see if we have any questions from the audience. Yes, thank you guys so much for sharing all of your stories and these key negotiation strategies with all of us over at SheTech. The audience has been so excited. I think that we have a new maximum amount of questions that people have asked us. I had to get a second piece of paper today. Great. Uh, we might not have time for all of them today, but we will get all the answers posted into the SheTech community as well. But um, one that I got in before the event was uh, from one of our audience members, Beth. She wrote in to ask us, how do you stand firm with the amount that you feel that you should be getting when you get hired? Uh, Beth has found that many times the employers will only give you what, they, what you're looking for after a 90-day trial period. How can you approach this so you can get what you feel is the right salary that you want from the start rather than buying into that trial period? Well, I think that you, you know what you're worth because you've already done your homework. You know people at the firm uh, that you're going to uh, that are making that kind of salary. Uh, I think that what you could negotiate for is maybe a shorter period instead of the 90 days, you know, give it 30 days. But I do think that there's the, the something important to be said about patience. If you really want that job and you really are um, looking for a longer term career with that company, you want to get your foot in the door. It has happened to me many times where, you know, my, my early career, I took on a job. It was not paying what other people were getting paid, but I took it anyway because I knew that I could prove myself. I could learn. And also, it could be a place where I leaked from to another company or another position, some other place that could give me what I wanted and even more. So I think that you cannot be really short-term oriented. 90 days is nothing. If a year after you're gonna get what everybody else is getting or what you're gonna have is an addition to your experience or your resume to your background that makes you a much more valuable individual, you know that 90 days is nothing. So. I think that uh, you have to sometimes step back, think forward. And I think that short-term sacrifices are worth much more longer-term rewards. I love that. You are so full of quotable quotes. Step back, think forward. I put that in the chat so everybody can see. Made that up. <laughs> I know, but I mean, it's so good. That's what I'm, I'm saying, though, is you always come up with such great ways to express that because I never would have thought of it negotiating a 30-day period instead. So it's great hearing that other way of thinking about things. We also got one in my email inbox right before we got started today. Uh, one of our audience members, Richard, wrote in to ask, and uh, I really identified with what he had to say. He said, after making a decent salary in a 30-year career, I now find myself competing not just against other candidates, but also against COVID-19. With so many others in my, jo uh, my job category as a job coach, positions are now starting at $12 to $16 an hour, where previously I was making significantly more. How can we negotiate more effectively for our worth? I know that I have value, and so do the employers. How can we raise that starting salary? Yeah. Um, that starting salary is not acceptable. I think that making a case of what your cost of living is and in a compassionate way, asking for a much higher wage 
on an hourly basis is not out of the ordinary. I think that you make a case. I remember, you know, when um, when I was working with mostly men, men would always say, I have kids, I have expenses, I have to buy shoes, I have to pay, pay for the, you know, the, the mortgage or whatever. Men are very good in being firm in terms of explaining their financial situation. And I think you can do the same, you know, explain your financial situation and also how much more valuable you are because of your 30 years of experience. I think stress the loyalty that goes with it, stress the hard work that you're able to do and your willingness to put a lot more into it in terms of over delivering what's expected of you. And I, I think that, you know, you would have a much better chance of getting a significantly, you know, higher compensation. But also the willingness to work, you know, different hours or to pitch in when somebody's out, uh, to get maybe a little bit more overtime. Um, I think that offering, you know, flexibility helps a lot, but not everybody can be flexible, especially with kids at home. And, you know, but I, I think if you work 30 years, hopefully your kids are pretty much, you know, set in their ways uh, and um, you don't have to worry about them. All right, great. Thank you so much. We're just starting to bump up against one o'clock and I can see that some of our participants have a bit of a hard stop because people are starting to head out. But I just wanted to say, Thank you so much again for being a part of our episode today, Maria. I really think that a lot of people have learned a lot from, from hearing from you guys today. Happy to help. Before Thank we you, go, Maria. I just wanted to invite everyone that's watching us to come and join us over in the SheTech Power community. You'll find us over at SheTech.net. The SheTech mission is, again, to increase the number of women in the tech staffing pipeline, and we do this through engaging, empowering, and employing women and allies who are just like you. We're not just women, we're also allies too. Engage with us in our community's active discussion board. For example, tomorrow we're going to have a great conversation about our own negotiation struggles and successes. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you. We can connect with each other from all around the country, learn from each other, and then share those learnings out even more. The SheTech community also allows for you to match with others based on interests and skills in your profile so you can find somebody else that can answer that very specific question that you have about your specific niche or your job. You can empower yourself with the SheTech community resources. We offer trainings and top tech skills like Tableau, Salesforce, DevOps, and more. Increase your skills, bulk up your resume, and get you hired. Catch our on-demand trainings on our YouTube channel. Use our free downloadable worksheets to set effective goals and develop self-branding strategies. We want you to use the SheTech community for the tools that you need to increase your tech skills. And if you don't see something that you need, make a post and tell us so we can build it out for you. Finally, find a new job and get employed. Use your new negotiation skills to get a higher salary on the SheTech community careers page. We post hot new tech opportunities around New Jersey, New York, the rest of the United States every week. From highly skilled and paid roles to entry-level positions suited for those just getting started, we've got a position for everyone. Stop by SheTech Careers and come find your next job today. Come join our community at SheTech.net and come take advantage of our resources. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us here today for Episode 7. And thanks again to our guests, Maria Ramirez of MFR Inc. and Chaya Pamula of SheTech and Pam10. Stay plugged into the outlet. Join us in our community at SheTech.net for a follow-up conversation. We have more episodes coming up, so check out SheTech.net slash events and come fill out your calendar and talk to you guys all soon. Thanks again so much for being here today with us, guys. Thanks, Meg. Maria, pleasure Thank as always talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.